Hi, my name is Lou Solace Haven, and this is What Is To Be Done, Love, Rage and Revolution. And I am joined by the wonderful Orla Quinn, uh, who lives, who's a comeback kid like myself, living uh, in Mid-Ulster. <laughs> we went <laughs> off, we travelled the world, we lived away, and then we came back for our sins to the country. Uh, Orla worked in Dublin for a while in international development on climate justice and we've recently connected and has had some wonderful conversations and have so much in common in terms of our hopes and our aspirations and how we view activism and what we think needs to be done in terms of the climate crisis. So I'm absolutely delighted to have Orla with me and we're going to have some great crack and we're going to have a great chat and oh my mm -hmm. God, there's going to be some incredible feminine energy coming from this podcast. I can feel it already. So hello <laughs> Orla and welcome. Hello sister and yeah, I love that. I love the phrase, the comeback kids. I would say yeah, the comeback countries. We're back in the country. <laughs> yeah, but yeah indeed so tell us a bit Orla about what we, you were up to when you left for the bright lights and uh what your activism involved I uh, well so so basically um my activism started in international development as you said you know like I was really um very much I was always interested in human rights I was always interested in climate and the issue of climate and I ended up working in um, working with Trokra in the head office in, in Dublin or actually in Maynooth. But and I ended up on the climate desk. So that was, you know, that was that meant um, working on educational resources for for volunteers, for uh, some of our supporters, uh, for some of our campaigns, working directly with, on advocacy with politicians and working on coalitions then with other organizations that were interested in climate justice, like Friends of the Earth, you know, Stop Climate Chaos, Concern, some of the other, you know, where when we were organizing kind of um, uh, coalition events in the in the capital. So, yeah, so it was a big scope and I got a lot. I mean, I, I kind of thought, yeah, this is this is what I want to do. Um, I'm in my element here and I'm really working on an issue that's so important to me. But for me, Louise, and I'm sure like you, um, impact is really where it's at. Like, and you're constantly questioning yourself, am I having impact? Yeah. And I realized that actually NGOs in all the good that they're doing, they don't have the same impact as they don't they don't have impact well let's just say they they have reduced impact <laughs> yes. um, and what I started to get interested in at that stage was local um, local grassroots issues and I started to look and sort of just take an interest in terms of just my own volunteering you know my own activism but then I and this at the time that was um there was the Corb, um, there was Corb oil down in Mayo. I don't know if you remember that. And um, so that was happening in the country kind of when I was working in Trokra. Um, also, um, fracking had started to happen as well in places like Leitrim and along, you know, the West, the West Coast. So I just started to get really interested in that and then visiting. I started to visit these communities. I eventually then took a year out and did a master's on local activism like the the importance or the problem more so of having alliances like NGOs in local grassroots uh, campaigns mm -hmm. and this was all I guess this was just all my own research this was all my own observation this was me going to these places and meeting other activists and realizing that no one is on their side they have to mobilize strong you know it, it's down to them to mobilize uh, if they want real change because it's not going to come from the top 
Yeah, they have to mobilize strong. And I've noticed that too, actually, with in yours talking about NGOs, mine would be more in looking at the institutions and the academy and academia and universities. It's very, very mm-hmm. difficult to be effective and to have much of an impact. I think a lot of it's because of the bureaucracy and the admin and the po- like the the policy us to death. You know, whereas actually mm-hmm. not much is getting done. Like I love David Graeber. Have you ever read Bullshit Jobs? It's like he, right. He talks about like how the states, the state just administrates us all to death. Because not yeah, not I call it yeah, I call it professionalization. Ah, you know, yeah, yeah, professionalization. Because when I was doing my research on um on the masters um and i looked at the effectiveness of the anti-nuclear campaigns down in wicklow or whatever back in the 70s a lot of those people who stopped the nuclear um the, you know the the nuclear plants being established became uh, became active like sort of started to work in the area mm-hmm. and all of a sudden you know became silent uh so there's a certain when you go that route of professionalization it does because you you spend all day working at the desk so you're tired in the evenings you don't can't go out and join a campaign or go and meet activist friends and start planning what next to do you know local activist um or or even get involved in any like local campaigns because you're you're tired from working at a desk all day yeah right so you become institutionalized yeah through profession and in that institutionalized institutionalization, you become ineffective. Like, yes, mm. I agree. I couldn't agree more. I that's why I say to people, people don't understand. I am like I hate institutions, and they're like, why, why? Because they pay so many people, and they they're paid to defend the institutions. They're not to pay. They're not paid to defend the public or to support the public. The institutions defend the institutions and the staff. But the institutions are supposed to be there in the best interest of the public. But they mm. that's become a nonsense. Well, I think it's just become it, it's it's become imbalanced. I think yes. yes, there's a there's a place for institutions, right? Mm-hmm. And there's a place for bureaucracy, and there's a place for, you know, if we didn't have systems, we wouldn't have uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, we need we need systems in society. I feel when it gets too imbalanced, that's the problem. And so you, when you have a lot of people working in institutions who should be should be mobilizing, they should be mobilizing people at home. They should be working on local campaigns that affect them and their communities because they're working on a international desk that um, you know has no relationship to what's happening in their own community. That's when it becomes a problem. Right. So I'm not I'm saying like you don't no need to throw the bathwater out with the with the baby type thing. It's more that when it becomes too imbalanced. And I looked at Cambodia as an example of this, because in Cambodia, there is no I mean, the the country is saturated with NGOs, saturated with NGOs. And as a result, there is no grassroots mobilization like none. And what I concluded from that was that when it's overly done, then it becomes a problem. And I think that is what hap- has happened in Ireland as well. We've become overly, overly professionalized. Oh, my God, that is such a great way of looking at it. Because, yeah, I would be inclined to go institutions or just like like this big whoa, sweeping <laughs> statements or, you know, but I, but I actually also then you look at you look at Cambodia, I would look at uh, like. Bhutan and that actually seems to they would have systems and services that are quite effective but they're actually a Buddhist monarchy but then mm-hmm. I think that would often come to the conversations we have about uh, and the one I've just had with um, Jonah Carabo and then looking at even Phoebe Plummer which was the reason we got you got in touch with me uh, we, we you, you listened to that podcast and then you're like yeah. Do you like that and I'm like yeah because that's the activists they're, they're the ones and the, they're the ones actually getting they're getting the flack, they're getting the fallout, but they're taking on the state and they're not playing by any of the rules. Because that's the reason why I 
I I suppose I have that strong disdain for institutions because they take on brilliant minds, they take on brilliant people, and as soon as they pay them and give them a contract, they are rendering them pretty ineffective. And actually, I think it destroys their soul to a yeah. certain extent. You know what I mean? Because they know that they they want to do more, but they can't because they're bound by these policies and by these contracts, which actually render them ineffective. So it kind of is soul destroying in a way. So I know you talk about imbalance, but I just can't see at this time of emergency, how institutions, how you can be effective at all and be really, you can have your foot in an institution. You can't be all the way in and be very effective yeah. at this point. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, I think it's just, you know, as long, I think if, 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 if <laughs> you know, if institutions started to educate local people and started to support local causes, that would make a huge difference, right? Mm -hmm. If, if they started educating people on what's happening in their local community, so you know what what are the injustices that are happening on our own doorstep and how to get involved in that how to mobilize on that because that is a huge education and most activists don't learn that at school like they have, they have to learn that in the camp they learn that from their friends you know and sometimes you know education when it's held in a in a when it's held in a in a way that is neutral but giving all the information then that you can make choices. But as we know, like we, when we learn things from the street, we often can be misinformed. And I just think that th this is a big misservice to, you know, education, like you're in academia, that is the disservice that academia are not helping us to realize, to, to mobilize in our own communities. And that mobilization is all to do with self-sovereignty. Oh, I love your I love your views on sovereignty, but that's I like I home educate I home educate the education system in Northern Ireland like good results it's the most disgraceful it is disgusting the levels of segregation like even the integrated schools are Christian integrated the amount of control and power like religion and churches have that's detrimental to climate education that's detrimental to autonomy that's detrimental to sovereignty. Because they're not mm -hmm. educating them on sex, pleasure, physical health, mental health, all that there. They're just they're just like qualification factories. And then they're coming out. And they're not educated. They're indoctrinated or they're kind of like, here, just get a job and make sure it's a good one and make sure you make loads of money and get your big house in your car. And then that's you. And that is exactly. the opposite of what we need in terms of the climate crisis. Exactly, because what you need in um what you need in these communities are creative thinkers, right? You need people who can think for themselves and who can problem solve. And we don't our education system does not does not result, it doesn't value those kind of skills. No. And as you say, it's just a qualification factory and that's it. People come out without any skills. I know I didn't come out with any skills. I went to a teaching college and got skills. But you know what I mean? I didn't leave school and get skills. I left, I left school to get, not, yes, I had some knowledge, but you forget knowledge. You need skills, right? And so this is where, you know, this is the problem solving, the creative mind is what you need when it comes to any kind of mobilization. That's the most effective. And unfortunately, we, yeah, our, our, our systems have, yeah, have deliberately, I would say, not given us those skills we have to we've we've had to go and find them ourselves and those of us who have tend to become activists a lot or musicians musicians tend to be active as well they tend to be you know a lot more active and you know there's conscious socially conscious people you know people who are interested in work or are more uh, affected by the environment maybe and i think this is it it's just I think anyway, that is, you know, not to go on about it, but it's just, it goes back to this thing of, we first need to change who we are. We first need to get out of our comfort zone before we start even getting concerned about the environment because we're just too damn comfortable, you know? 
oh god we are too damn comfortable see the middle classes here in northern ireland oh and they believe that like being apolitical and apathetic and you know just you know we don't want to rock the boat and we just get on with it we just shop mark and spencer's and we drive our jeeps and everything's okay and that's fine because it's very civilized to be indifferent to everything political and we're not going to panic and we're not going to show emotion and we're not going to mobilize because that's ridiculous i remember i had a solicitor say to me that um this is a solicitor who thought they were environmentalists said to me that they felt sorry for people who who did any kind of protest mm. they felt sorry they look at oh per you and i was like what the actual fuck has just come out of your mouth mm -hmm. do you know what i mean like the mm. privilege was cringeworthy yeah yeah well that's it you know that's where they're at you know it's it's um yeah they they kind of have a, a very you know a very comfortable existence and they don't want to rock any boats and they don't want to cause any conflict and you know and you know we're taught to be kind we're taught to put others to be put to put others before ourselves and we're we're definitely not taught to um care about the environment you know like those of us who are farmers daughters are we're always led to believe that the the that the environment and the land was here for our profit so you know so our value system is is all skewed against any kind of activism yeah you know especially climate activism yeah which is just which is just actually for you know whenever you're dealing with people who who a lot of people in society would see them as very intelligent people and they're mm. putting themselves forward as environmentalists in this age of IPCC report breakdown, climate scientists just like desperately ringing the bell. And a highly educated, highly professional, well-paid woman who says they're an environmentalist leading an environmentalist community group says something like that. I just think, oh my goodness, we're we're it's even problematic within the movement in terms of the privilege and stuff. Because I say that's a form of climate denial. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think being that complacent and like protests and do, I, I think that's a form of climate denial because at this point in the game, if if we do believe that our governments are going to sort this out, you're deluded. Mm. Can you tell me a bit more about what you think in terms of the state and the government and politicians and and what we can expect from them? in terms of environmental action do you think we can expect anything well yeah no my experience would be um they're not they they they're also professional and they're also on site of big business and even though they'll want to tell you that they support you and that they're they're concerned ultimately their hands are tied because yes. their their party have already made uh, they've already made the deals, they've already changed legislation. And so, you know, it's useless. And even if they are a conscious person and they are concerned about the environment, their hands are tied. So very often there's, you know, uh, the deals are already done at the top. So it's a case of, um, it's a usually a very ineffective route, in my opinion. I... So I know that Phoebe um, was a, is involved in direct action and I know that that's a very radical route for people to take and I know not everybody can do it, especially as we were saying, the majority of people are very comfortable. They're comfortable armchair watchers, so you're not going to get them <laughs> out disrupting. Um, but what, you know, what I feel like what we can do is turn this into a love movement and not a kind of a, a judgment where we are saying you're, you know, you're not effective, therefore you're no good, you know, rather, rather than doing that sort of say, right, well, what can you do from your place, from your solicitor chair, from your teacher chair, from your armchair, <laughs> what can you do? 
And if we all consciously decide to do something, mm -hmm. then then we are acting from a much more conscious place. And I think that that's where we should be really focusing our attention rather than the bashing, really looking at, OK, well, where's this love movement around the environment? Let's start to love the environment start to show that in everything we do from switching off lights to cycling more to just being you know taking these small decisions and the one that I am lucky to be able to do and that many of my friends are doing is we're starting to grow Certainly. we're starting to grow our own food mm -hmm. and that's really small I grew you know I grew my own tomatoes my own spuds my own peas kale um like about five five veg I grew last year and I was on top of the world and that you know if you have a garden if you, even if it's a small garden because you can do all of this in pots you don't need land you don't need to plant it in the land you've got any kind of space at all even inside your house <laughs> you can grow vegetables and you will not realize the joy that brings you to do that as well as the part you're playing for the environment love it i'm terrible at growing like really like i i i need to need to do some plant whispering courses or some plant like guidance you know like <laughs> i like blood i i water them too much or something happens or i don't get it right so i'm i'm gonna try this year orla with your kind assistance to grow yes absolutely i'll, okay. I'll definitely help uh-huh <laughs> yeah but that's brilliant but that but then you talk about that growing too and you you, you talk and I love the way you talk about sovereignty mm. and I'm not always like it's not something you're used to hearing people talk about and I also want to just quickly say about the thing you said about not shaming people there's a quote I heard that says you cannot shame people into change you can only love them into evolution yeah I love it yeah I love it yeah. Oh, but I'm a big but I think also with politicians I do think you have to be critical with them because that's their language to be political is to be critical so it's so important yeah. that those voices are heard too but I do agree the shaming is not necessarily important but you need to speak truth to power but you see what you say about sovereignty tell me more about your ideas and your feelings around being sovereign and sovereignty yeah okay well look I'll give you an example when I was when I was doing my grassroots kind of when I was really investigating my grassroots movement, um, there was a campaign in uh, Leitrim at the time called Love Leitrim, and it was really anti fracking, right? Mm -hmm. But they didn't call it anti fracking; they called it Love Leitrim, mm -hmm. and they called it Love Tourism, and they called it Love Farming, and Love um, Love People, mm -hmm. and so it was focused on all. Well, first of all, it was very clever because it focused on all of the the love business. It, it focused on all of the things that would be affected if fracking went ahead. Like it would be negatively impacted if fracking went ahead. But it but it changed the focus from anti mm -hmm. to, um, as you said, the love of evolution really changed people um, and really mobilized people from that place of love. Mm -hmm. And it was so effective. I mean, it actually was effective. They did ban at the time they banned fracking in Leitrim mm -hmm. because it had gotten so much involvement with the local community and the and this local community, local farmers became really educated, traveled to Dublin, spoke to politicians, became so sovereign in that journey of activism that they were not intimidated by power at the end of the day. Whereas, you know, whereas most of us are, let's let's face it, most Joe public is intimidated by power. But when you go on that journey of starting to love, starting to love your local area, starting to love your land, starting to love your your health, starting to love your water, so that none of that is good, that, so that you're protecting all of that. You know, if you love something, you will protect it. And it'll come to the stage where if you love it that much, you will protect it to death. You'll protect it, you know, by whatever means. And and that's 
what I'm talking, these people became so protective mm-hmm. of their beautiful county because, by the way, Leitrim is our hidden gem. It is the most gorgeous county. Wow, I was blown away. But so is Tyrone and so is yeah. all of these counties. And so I feel like we need to start loving where we're from. We need to start loving our place as much as we love our own body. And yes. and that's controversial because we, you know, we've been told to love everybody else and not ourselves. You know, we've grown up in a society where how dare you be selfish? And unfortunately, most people, you know, believe that they believe if they love themselves, they are selfish. Mm-hmm. So I just feel like we need to there's so many values that we need to change and they are changing. Thank God they're changing. They're changing slowly, but we really need to get on that fast track with changing these values so that we start loving ourselves and our place where we're from. Yeah. And this comes up in my practice as a therapist a lot, this whole, particularly with those born, you know, or assigned female at birth or identify as women that the the saying i love myself uh i love myself first there's a affirmations i've been telling everybody about at the minute is i love myself first i love myself most i love myself always and Mm -hmm. i I saw that on a netflix documentary recently and i just think this is amazing but there's so many of my clients be like but that's not right you know i can't i love i have to love other people more what i'm trying to say is well that will happen Mm-hmm. And those relationships will be much better when you put, I love myself first, I love myself most, I love myself always. It has that ripple effect. It will only benefit those other relationships when you do that. But it is, we've been so conditioned, that's really selfish. That's yeah. actually, people like at the minute, you know, the buzzwords at the minute are like narcissistic and toxic and all that there. So, you know, you're you're going to be accused of narcissism and being narcissistic. But that's because I don't think people understand what love is. That's why I'm obsessed yeah. with it. They don't understand love is very tender. It doesn't mean I love myself and I go, no, I'm not doing anything for you because I'm loving myself. That's not it. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like today, I don't have the spoons. So we talk about that as in autism too. I don't have the spoons to deal with it. I can't, I will get back to you later. I just am not feeling great. It's being mm-hmm. like gentle, tender, cherished, caring, compassionate. Mm-hmm. it's not that hard I put myself first and I'm gonna mess everybody over and that's what I think people think when they hear that yeah do you, yeah. Do you know what I mean they confuse they don't understand what love is yeah I think you're right I think it's really misconstrued and and it's just misunderstood you know yeah and 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 exactly what you're saying it's 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 like the deeper and the more you love yourself the more you have capacity to love others you know um if you're always giving you're depleted and you can't ultimately love other people and you certainly can't love yourself because you're so depleted so it's 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 very you know it's common sense but it's very misunderstood you know and it's and i suppose we've been conditioned to believe that it's wrong anyway so um so we're we're relearning we're really learning how to be and then it goes back to okay well when you love yourself it goes back to that thing of well when you love yourself you have greater capacity to love others but more importantly in our current circumstances and what we're talking about here is love your place love your land love this land and move away from a relationship of you know um this land is for my benefit. This land is for my profit. This land is for my need to become a steward, to become a guardian of the land. And that's the relationship we need to move from with, with our place, with, with farming, with growing. Um, and it's, and un- unfortunately, we have a long way to go into Rome because it's a very industrial agricultural, it's big agriculture, it's big farms. The smaller farms are being pushed out for these big farms. Um, there's a there's a ton of hen houses. I think there's a ridiculous number of battery farming in Tyrone versus any other county. It's we've got gold mining on our doorstep. Do you know what I mean? It's like we are a hot spot of of basically bad farming practice old farming practice 
and it's and it's why and it and it's because we don't have a good relationship with the land we don't have this relationship of guardianship we don't have this related relationship of being a steward of this land we do, it's just absent like i'm talking total gobbledygook to most people when i say something like this you know not to me it makes complete sense and that's yeah. why i love hearing it because it's like it makes sense but how can i become connected to land when i'm not allowed to access it i'm not allowed near it i'm i'm actually you know you think about scotland right to rome you think about like if they have pathways through england we, what, how can i walk around the spurns freely i can't and I, it's beautiful. I love going to Spurns. How can I connect and really enjoy the beauty and, you know, have enjoy that, that, because once you have that connection, you will protect it. Like you say, you will feel like really, really, but this in the North where it's disgraceful, you can't, you can't even connect it. You know, like there's no walkways through the Spurns. You can't, yeah. like this area, it's an area of outstanding natural beauty. There's only there's very small places that you can go and actually connect with in the spurns. And then yeah. you know, so that is kind of you know, we're being failed on so many levels in terms of like we, a lot so many people you talk to people, they know how beautiful it is. They they will say you say to most people of oh, gold mine in the spurns is an area of natural beauty, they're like, Well, that's a bit ridiculous. Yeah. Well, have any of them visited? Can they visit the site, which is stunning? Look, no, because there's no real way to, like, nobody's actually helping us connect with that area of outstanding natural beauty. Yeah, there's no access. Yeah. No, no access. Yeah. No, yeah, and it's it's designed, you know, it's 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 designed very well. The places that you you connect to are forest parks, you know. So most most places, um have old estates which are now sort of in the control of of government or council and so they're they're public pathways public access points um there's and yeah where that does give you access it does give you access to trees and it gives you if you're lucky river there'd be a river going through it and it's beautiful and i get i know i go for my you know, for my healing, I go to the forest. Mm -hmm. I I connect with the trees. I connect with the forest, and that 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 uh that not only only helps my mental capacity, but it really gives me hope and gives me joy. Right? We know that. I I know that. Um, also, when it comes to growing, like I said before, you can you know you can get soil. You know, compost is soil. You can just grow stuff in plants in pots yeah. uh, you know you don't you know Louise you don't actually you don't need to have your own land to have that relationship with nature is what I'm saying yeah. you can still foster that relationship with nature by you by utilizing what we have and what we can when we don't have our own land and I but I do believe that yeah it's it's where when for those who are fortunate enough and it's interesting in Clare a lot of women are buying land in Clare it's mm -hmm. it's a new it's kind of a it's a really positive change because they're buying land in order to change that relationship from from um, profiting to stewarding and and I believe that that's going to happen here someday um that's my hope that's my dream because i think that once we start accessing the land we can start changing the relationship with it would that not be a core aim of like the love movement that we were talking about Even yes let's, let's just let's just buy land okay that could be our that could be our aim that could be our goal is to buy land and then just love it love on it yeah. Bring the world to it. And Louise, like, I have this vision here of bringing people, like, I, I want to show people it, once I have, like, I've planted 88 trees. I've, you know, I've, I've a couple of veg beds. I, I want to create an environment where people will want to, you know, come and enjoy and see and eat, <laughs> you know, um, from, from the garden. Um, I want to yeah. show that. And I want to show people that, you know, from a simple like square meter, whatever, you know, 
um, you can you can really do a lot even in a small space, right? So you don't need a farm. Yeah, I, I also think like we are nature, right? So we can connect. We are always connected. But as in that, I think that loving of nature, that loving of the world is a big part of us. So if we don't feel that, we are not fully connected to our true selves. Yeah. I like I was at the first year of my PhD, I was in, in the graduate school, right? And there was I was we were doing a media training course and they got me up to the front and they were talking about my researchers' nature experiences and mental health, which is a lot of what we're talking about. And they they were, you know, trying to interrogate me and seeing how I would deal with like media and all. And they went, so basically, what are you saying? Are you saying that everybody needs to go around and hug trees, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yes. <laughs> we all burst out laughing, but I wasn't actually joking. <laughs> I was like, I, and then I thought about that. I was like, yeah, they think I'm completely mad, but I think they're completely mad for not getting this. How can they not understand how important trees are? Like, how do people not get it? Like, we have a completely symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. You love trees and you really appreciate them. And you have favorite trees, which you do. And you really value and honor them. And when you lose your shit because a farmer cuts down your back tree, which I did, and the police had to get involved because he cut down a hawthorn tree, right? Mm -hmm. People think that's crazy. But Mm -hmm. I'm like, what part of this do you not not get? We're cutting our trees down at an alarming rate. They take in our waste. Mm-hmm. These trees take in what we exhale and we inhale what they exhale. It's a completely symbiotic relationship. We're dependent on them. But, they, but most people are so disconnected from our true selves and our place in the world that they think it's crazy to love trees. You know what? And our ancestors knew about this relationship. Um, in Old Ireland during the Brehan Laws, it was one of the worst offences to cut down a tree. Like it was, you know, it was one of the worst punishable offences. You did not, you know, trees were sacred as were bees. There were certain animals and beings in nature that were really protected, like yeah. to the nth, you know. So we've just forgotten ourselves you know mm-hmm. we've forgotten ourselves because we used to know um and i think for those of us who are you know who are conscious and who hug trees we know the benefits of doing it like we've i know i get so much joy and peace and just absolute contentment leave all my worries and concerns behind me when I go into the forest but that's a relationship you know you don't get that straight away you kind of have to you have to tap into the forest you don't just go most people go with their earphones on you know so they're not consciously connecting you need to go on that conscious connection journey to get that to get that benefit and you you talk about putting your hands and so I would sometimes like it's not always like hugging or, or you know but I, you know you can but I would touch sometimes I just touch a tree gently and I'm always like it's not like a this is for it's kind of like yeah thank you and and I there would be places that I would go to for guidance because I'm an ecotherapist and I really really agree with what you're saying about old practices and we've forgotten we've forgotten this relationship because if I really really struggle with something I'll go to White Park Bay I'll spend a few hours on White Park Bay on the North Coast and I'll have got more guidance and I'll be like, you know, help me with this or kind of, and I talk at my conversations with God and I'm not religious, um, but I would say I need to go and have a conversation with God or I need to have a conversation and I need a bit of support. And, and that's like, that's what, you know, we, that's the way I connect with it. But we're going to wrap up now because I know you've got to, you've got to be getting away. But tell me, right, what would you like to see us do on the island of Ireland um, in terms of what we've been talking about? But in terms of this is a podcast called What Is To Be Done? It's ultimately about the climate crisis and what we could all be doing. So what would you like to see more of, Orla? Right. Well, something that um, so me and my friends have all come come together and, and, and with a common kind of. I suppose concern that we can't get 
locally organic raw produce um and you see the benefit how i knew that this is possible is because i've lived in communities where all of this is possible where you go into the local shop and you can get raw yogurt and raw milk and raw um you know bread freshly baked bread that have all been produced in the local community mm -hmm. this doesn't exist here and i think that, again this is because we don't have a connection with our place and we're not you know we we're not producing our own and this comes back to the sovereignty piece once we start to produce our own that's what gives us sovereignty it's an amazing process of development that that goes on and louise like when you start growing your own you will not only be so proud of yourself but you will also start feeling a lot more self-sufficient and when you set when you start feeling self-sufficient you're like i don't need the supermarket i don't need the government i don't need all of this power because i'm really producing my own stuff here and we the community are producing our own stuff and so i really think when our when my friends joined together we decided okay why not set up our own farmers market local organic and try and source these 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 products that we can all eat and enjoy and provide for others because once people start once people start purchasing different as well they're going to realize how important these are and then you know it's about it's about connecting the dots like once you realize that actually locally organic produce is important we need the land for that then we need to protect the land we need to protect what we have in our locality and I just think that's where we need to start we need to start with ourselves our local community and then look bigger look beyond the world but if you're if your house isn't in in good shape and your community isn't I need I think you really need to start you really need to start local and yeah and so that's where I would you know and you know build your tribe have your community so you know like Louise the Earth Mamas is, is super because it's yeah. like feeds me and it's feeding my purpose and feeding where I'm at because a lot of the people around me are not there you know they think I'm Lula when I come to talking about guardianship and stewardship so I need to be amongst people like us you know that we can you know that we can we can be we woo, woo together and yeah. I just think that <laughs> and I just think that yeah we we really do need to start bringing people on board though like I think this is really important because um whilst we whilst we support each other and create these spaces together we need to educate because a lot of people just don't have that education and I think that's our responsibility well I think the love movement I think is that the love movement should be about growing your own as a community and coming together to grow your own maybe then things like that yeah I can't do it by myself like I'm saying yeah. well mom now and I need that community to help me grow because I could try growing in my back garden and probably fail because I'm just not that skilled I'm a bit Crap. Yeah. yeah, and that's okay because I've got all yeah. these skills and stuff. Do you know what I mean? Exactly, and that's okay because there's others that'll do it. And Louise, that's why we need to do it together. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Amen, sister. Amen. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much, Orla. As always, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah, love, rage, and revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks.